thank you very much, um, all of you, for uh, being here. Um, today we have a very nice seminar. We have a, um, uh, one of the best researchers in the field of parasitology, the ecology of parasites, um, the evolutionary ecology of parasites. And um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me, because I'm a big fan of his research, to have um, Bob Poland here with us. Um, he's, a, he's a full professor at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Um, although he's uh, originally from Canada, I, I know now. And, um, and he has published a huge number of papers, but it's not that huge number. What is impressive is the, how influential they have been for many of us. So um, it is again um, a big pleasure to, um, to have uh, Bob Polan uh, talking to us. Welcome, Bob. Um, you know, um, initially when we started these conversations, it was, it was before the pandemic. I, uh, by then, I wanted to have you here and, and talk to you about many things. And, um, but this is how it is. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And just a, just a small announcement. If any of you want um, to talk to uh, Dr. Polan um, about your work, about like many other things, um, Bob is, um, is completely flexible. So you can talk to him after the talk. So thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, not only for the the invitation to talk, but uh, initially for the invitation to come to Mexico. I I would have been so happy to be there in person to talk to all of you, but uh, things are what they are. So we'll we'll have to do it this way. Um, what I want to discuss today is obviously the biology of parasites, but really my talk is about mind control. And we often think of mind control as something that is, uh, you know, an important part of, of the scenario in many movies, cartoons, TV shows, and so on. It's something often associated with fiction. But the reality is that in nature, many organisms are controlled by other organisms. And this is a phenomenon that I've been studying for a little over 30 years now. Ever since, as a graduate student, I read this book by Richard Dawkins, The Extended Phenotype. In this book, Dawkins argues that genes inside one organism can have phenotypic effects on a different organism. And the best example he could come up with were some studies available at the time that showed that parasites can take over uh, the control of the behavior of their host to make their host do things that benefit the parasite. Now, I thought that was the most fascinating idea that I had ever heard. And ever since that day, I've been studying this phenomenon on and off. So this is what I want to talk about today. And there will be three parts to my talk. First of all, I'll give you a brief introduction to this phenomenon emphasizing mostly the types of, of conditions or the types of transmission modes where natural selection has repeatedly uh, favored the evolution of parasites that can alter host behavior. Secondly, I will argue that this phenomenon, uh, although it does provide good stories that you can share with your friends at parties, this phenomenon is just not a weird anomaly. It's something that is widespread in nature and it can influence all sorts of studies that are conducted in behavior and ecology. And if parasites are ignored, the results that we obtain in those studies might be misinterpreted. And finally, the third and final part of the talk, which is also the main one, uh, is where I will explore some of the mechanisms used by parasites to alter host behavior or host phenotype. But first, my little introduction. Well, in my view, there are several different ways of classifying the types of manipulations of host behavior by parasites. They depend on the type of transmission modes. And there are four types of transmissions where natural selection has repeatedly favored parasites that can do this. So I will discuss them briefly one at a time. And the first is transmission by vectors. This is when a parasite is taken up in a blood meal from one organism 
and it will be transmitted again through a blood meal to a second host. Many parasites use this mode of transmission. For instance, there are many uh, mosquito-borne diseases. These include things like the malaria parasites, but also a range of viruses and even small worms like the filarial nematodes. What's remarkable is that these completely different parasites that use a very similar mode of transmission have often been shown to alter the feeding behavior of the mosquito, causing mosquitoes to take shorter blood meals, but have to visit more host individuals, which is not necessarily a good thing for the mosquito, but it's an excellent way of transmitting the parasite. So this ability to manipulate vectors is quite common amongst vector-borne parasites. Another common uh, mode of transmission where uh, host manipulation has been documented many times is uh, that shown by parasitoids. Parasitoids are uh, insects that grow inside other insects until they're quite large, and then they come out to pupate attached to the outside environment. What's remarkable is that the parasitoid can cause its host to protect it against other predators. In the little video that is playing in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you can see these little white structures attached to the branch. These are the pupae of parasitoid wasps that have come out of this caterpillar. And although they're no longer in physical contact with the host, they have left the host, they're still controlling the host, forcing the host to stay around and protect them against crawling insects that might want to feed on them. The same is shown by the, the uh, uh, ladybird beetle at the bottom. It is sitting on top of its former parasite and it is protecting it against potential predators. So the remarkable thing here is that the parasite is no longer inside the host, but it is still affecting its behavior in a way that benefits the parasite. A third type of transmission mode where host manipulation is very common is what uh, it involves parasites that grow inside the host, but when it's time for them to continue their life cycle, they must come out of the host in a completely different microhabitat. So they force the host to visit a microhabitat where the host would never go normally. And this is common in mermitted nematodes, for instance. These worms grow to a large size inside a terrestrial arthropod, but they must come out of the host in water or in water-saturated substrate. This is the only place where they can survive and continue their life. And these have been shown to alter the behavior of their terrestrial host to make it find water or water-saturated substrate where the parasite can exit. There are other parasites with a similar sort of life cycles that do the same thing. And probably the most famous are airworms or members of the phylum nematomorpha. These are in a different phylum from the mermitids from the previous slide, but they have evolved a very similar life cycle through convergence. They also grow to a large size inside a terrestrial arthropod. They also absolutely have to come out in water to survive and continue their life. So what they do is they force their host to find water and jump into it. Just like the cricket you've been watching, it's been forced to jump in a swimming pool. This is a completely abnormal behavior. Crickets normally don't jump in water, but this one has been forced to do so by its parasite. After that, it might take a minute or two for the parasite to come out. You can see this one is even using its own body to push against the cricket. Uh, to get out completely. And when it's out, it will just swim around, leaving behind it a dead host. So these two uh, examples, the, the hairworms from the phylum nematomorpha and the mermitted nematodes are completely unrelated, but have converged in a similar life cycle and a similar ability to manipulate host behavior. I will come back to these parasites later in the talk. I just want to finish now with the fourth type of life cycle or transmission mode in which manipulation of the host is very common. And this is the one that has been studied the most. That is trophic transmission or transmission by predation. That is uh, when a parasite lives as a juvenile inside a prey organism 
but must be transmitted by predation to the definitive host, which is a predator. The classic textbook example of this particular life cycle involves the trematode Dichrocilium dendriticum, which at some point in its life cycle must be transmitted from an ant to a sheep. Of course, sheep don't feed on ants or other insects, they feed on grass. So what this parasite does is that it forces the ant to climb to the tip of a grass blade, bite into it, and stay there for hours at a time, awaiting a potential ingestion by a sheep, which would be amazing for the parasite. And if that doesn't work, the parasite can cause the ant to do this day after day until successful. Another classical example involves the protozoan Toxoplasma gondii. In its normal life cycle, oops, sorry. In its uh, normal life cycle, it must be transmitted from a rodent to a cat. Of course, rodents have anti-predator adaptations to avoid being eaten by a cat. So what the parasite does following infection of a rodent is that it can change its uh, attractions to certain odors to make it attracted to the odors of cats, something that is terrible for the, 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 the rodent, but excellent for parasite transmission. And it's not just the behavior of a prey animal that can be changed by a parasite. It can also be its appearance, such as its coloration, for instance. The six amphipods in these photos are all of the same species. They have all been collected within a couple of meters of each other, but yet they display extremely different coloration. Well, this is due to the parasites they harbor. The ones that are darker gray at the top or, or green, seen at the bottom here, tend to be infected by acanthocephalin parasites. There's one shown in the image there. And the ones that are green and blue, the ones shown in the bottom row, are likely to be infected by juvenile cestodes or tapeworms. Both of these parasites must complete their life cycle in a shorebird, like a seagull, for instance. And by changing the color of their host, uh, they make it more visible against a normal substrate, increasing the chances of transmission. But an even more striking example is offered by the nematode Myrmico nema. For its life cycle to be completed, it has to be transmitted by predation from an ant to a bird. The problem for this particular parasite is that the birds that are suitable for its development do not feed on ants. They feed on small fruit, like little berries. So what the parasite has evolved to do is that it can change the coloration of the rear end of its ant from black to red. It can also change the behavior of the ant, causing the ant to perch inside patches of berries and sit there for hours at a time. Now, in this picture, all of the red structures are little berries, except for one of them, which is part of an ant. You can see that the mimicry is quite good, and this presumably fools a bird into thinking it is eating a small fruit, whereas in fact it is eating a package of parasites. And perhaps the best known example of this phenomenon involves the trematode leucochloridium, which must be transmitted from a terrestrial snail to a bird. But it faces a similar problem to the previous parasite, in that uh, the birds that are suitable for its development don't feed on snails, but they feed on caterpillars or grubs. So what this parasite does is that it multiplies asexually, giving it a large size within a sac that contains all the parasites. And this large sac then migrates to the tentacles of the parasites, causing them to become large, transparent, so that we can see the, the striped patterns on the sac below. And the parasite is even capable of causing these tentacles to pulsate, Im imitating the movement of a moving caterpillar. So again, the parasite is using mimicry of a potential prey to facilitate its transmission by predation to a suitable host. Most examples of parasites that change the behavior or the appearance of their hosts are not this spectacular. So you might think that what I'm showing you are interesting little stories, but they're anomalies. 
they're nice stories to tell people, but they don't apply generally in nature. Well, this is not the right uh, thing at all because they are extremely common in nature. It's just that the, the changes caused by parasites are often very subtle and difficult to, uh, to notice or to measure. But this means that because they are universal, because all animals have some sorts of parasites, this phenomenon impacts all studies of animal behavior. And I just want to show you a couple of hypothetical examples illustrating how parasites can impact the studies of behavior using two large frameworks for the study of behaviors that have become dominant in the field in the last 10 or 15 years. And the first is the concept of animal personality. This idea that within a population, each individual might be characterized by a certain set of behaviors. And the ways in which people characterize animal personality is first by demonstrating that behavior shows consistency or or repeatability within an individual. So in the graph on the left here, if each particular symbol represents a different animal individual, and each individual has been measured for its behavior on three separate occasions, we can see that the variance within an individual is not very high. The behavior measurements are quite consistent. So the variance within individual is much less than the variance for the whole population. That is one of the characteristics of animal personality. Another one is what people refer to as behavioral syndromes, or the fact that across individuals within a population, pairs of behaviors might show significant correlations. So in the example shown here, um, the individuals that show high values for one behavior tend to show high values for the other behavior and vice versa, leading to a correlation between them. Well, I would argue that manipulative parasites are everywhere in nature and they can change these particular uh, measurements of animal personality. For instance, let's imagine that we have a particular behavior that shows repeatability or consistency when animals are not infected by parasites. This is shown by the white symbols on the left. Two animals, each showing consistent behaviors when they're measured many times. What happens if they are infected by a manipulative parasite? Well, maybe the average value of the behavioral measurement stays the same, but the variance could increase. And this is not necessarily just due to pathology or because the animal is sick. Natural selection might favor manipulative parasites that increase variance in behavioral responses. Imagine that the parasite has to be transmitted by predation, for example. In such a case, if the response of the infected prey to an approaching predator becomes unpredictable and variable, more often than not, this will lead to predation and therefore benefit the parasite. And manipulative parasites can also affect the measurements of behavioral syndromes. Again, here, if the, the white symbols represent uninfected animals, and if there is a positive correlation between two behaviors, what would happen if these animals are infected by a manipulative parasite? Well, many things can happen. Maybe the correlation will remain, maybe the correlation will be completely reversed, or maybe the correlations will be disappeared, as shown in the middle here, where the two behaviors become statistically uncoupled. They're no longer related. And again, this is not necessarily something that is associated with pathology. Natural selection may favor manipulative parasites that target behavioral correlations and change these correlations. Again, think of an animal that is infected by a parasite that must be transmitted by predation. When animals uh, try to avoid predators, often they need a certain series of behaviors to all work together. For example, maybe they need to move to a patch of microhabitat with a coloration that will provide them with camouflage, but they also need to remain motionless within this patch. If these two behaviors are uncoupled, they won't be very successful. Therefore, by targeting certain behavioral correlations and disrupting them, the manipulative parasite could improve its transmission. 
So it's been quite uh, satisfying for me to see that the paper where I suggested these things, uh, what, uh, nine years ago now, has been cited well over a hundred times now. So hopefully people who are studying animal personality are starting to take parasitism into account because the personality that they measure is not just the intrinsic personality of the animal. It is the product of an interaction between the animal's intrinsic personality changed by the influence of its parasites. It's important to distinguish between the two. My second example of how parasites matter for the study of behaviors involves the use of social networks to study all social interactions between animals that live in groups. It provides an, a holistic, comprehensive uh, understanding of every interactions within a group. And it's become a very popular um, approach in uh, social behavior studies. Graphically, a network looks a bit like this, where each circle represents an individual and the lines between them represent the interactions. In this case, the arrows uh, represent the direction of the interactions, and the thickness of these arrows represent the strength of the interactions. So for instance, if this represents a dominance network, it would suggest that the individual on the far right is a dominant individual because uh, it directs a lot of aggressive interactions towards the others, but it receives no aggression. So it looks like this individual is the dominant individual. Well, if this is what happens when they're not infected, what happens if this dominant individual is infected by a manipulative parasite that reduces its aggression level? And there are parasites that do this, by the way. So what would happen? Well, maybe this would happen. Suddenly, this individual would no longer be so aggressive. It would not uh, inter it would not initiate a lot of aggression, but it might receive some aggressive interactions, and it will no longer appear to be dominant. So in this case, if we ignore the role of parasites, we might misjudge the intrinsic dominance potential of individuals, because what we're measuring is not just their intrinsic potential, but also the influence of parasites. And manipulative parasites may do more than affect the, uh, the position or the role of individuals within a network. They can also change the structure of the entire network. Consider, for instance, a network of uninfected animals that is quite homogeneous, which means that each individual roughly interacts with the same random number of individuals. What would happen if about half of these individuals are infected by a manipulative parasite that changes the response to environmental stimuli. For instance, it might make them phototaxis, causing them to seek light and move towards light. Well, if half of uh, this network is infected by a parasite that change their responses to an environmental stimuli, it could lead to a spatial segregation of the infected and uninfected individuals. With all the infected individuals moving along an environmental gradient towards a stimulus that they respond to. There are parasites that do this. There are many parasites of aquatic crustaceans, for instance, that increase phototaxis such that the infected individuals move towards the surface, whereas uninfected individuals stay towards the bottom of the water. This uh, breaking of the network into two modules means that the interactions or the mating and, and reproductive interactions between individuals are now uh, segregated so that infected individuals only interact and mate with infected individuals and uninfected individuals only mate with each other. So these sorts of consequences of manipulative parasites are only now starting to be taken uh, into account into studies of uh, social networks and how animal interacts within groups. Let me now move on to the last part of the talk, where I wanted to address the mechanisms by which parasites uh, alter animal behavior. Many years ago, Nobel laureate Nico Tinbergen encouraged all scientists to study behavior, to study behavior from different angles. 
Specifically, he proposed four different questions or, or approaches to the study of behavior. In the context of manipulation of animals by parasites, certainly the aspect that has received the least attention has been their causation, the underlying physiological mechanisms by which the parasite changes the behavior of the host. And I'm not just saying this like, like that, there is actually empirical data that shows that this is the aspect that has received the least attention. This is from a study we published a few years ago, uh, which looks at publication trends in the field. Now, this figure considers only parasites transmitted by predation or, or transmitted trophically, but the same pattern applies to all sorts of other parasites. The gray line at the top represents the cumulative number of host species, parasite species combinations that have been studied in the context of manipulation of host behavior. And you can see that this line is rising rapidly. We are finding more and more examples of the phenomenon every year. The red line indicates the proportion of, or the subset of those uh, host parasite combinations where there have been studies of the, the, uh, the adaptive benefits for the parasite. So in this case, these are predation studies demonstrating whether or not infected animals are more su susceptible to predation, which would indicate that the parasite benefits. As you can see, fewer uh, host parasite combinations have been studied in this, in this particular respect probably because of the logistical difficulties of recreating predation studies. The blue line, though, is the interesting one. This represents the subsets of these host parasite combinations where people have looked for the mechanisms underlying the change in behavior. And you can see that until the year 2000, no one was studying this. It's only in the last 20 years, probably because of cheaper and, and more powerful technology, that people have started to look at the mechanisms. So what have we found in those years? What, what are the underlying mechanisms? Well, in some cases, they can be very simple. Maybe sometimes a parasite only needs to be at the right place at the right time. Consider this parasite, the Trematode tilodelphis, which lives in lakes not far from where I live. It must be transmitted at one point in its life cycle from a small fish to a predatory bird like the crested grebe shown here. What you're looking at now is the eye of a fish. And you can see that this is where the parasites are found. When they infect the fish, they move to the eyes. You can see that the parasite is quite large and it moves a lot. Now this fish only has one, but imagine if the fish had many. I apologize for the shaky video here. This was taken with a cell phone by my student, Brandon Rule, in the field under difficult condition. But you can see that this eye, which has been taken out of a fish, is full of parasites. In a situation like this, surely the vision of the fish is impaired by all these moving parasites in its eyes. And indeed, it's the case. You can see in the cross section here uh, uh, on the upper left of the slide, uh, this is an histological section of an eye. The round circle is the lens, and the dark lining at the back is the retina of the, of the eye. This is the surface that captures light stimulus coming from outside, uh, transforming them into an image in the brain of the fish. And you can see many parasites swimming around in there, blocking the arrival of the light towards the retina. So to quantify whether this was indeed an issue for the fish, uh, my former student Tony Stumbo used a special camera to film the retina of fish that were under anesthesia from the different angles just to go around the, uh, around the, uh, the lens and then analyzing the video footage and putting the different angles together, we could recreate uh, a map of the retinal area and quantify the percentage of time that each pixel on the retina was blocked by a parasite. So in these figures here, the darker the color indicates a high proportion of the time where the retina is blocked by a moving parasite. 
Tony repeated these studies at two different times of the day on the same fish. They were anesthetized in the morning and they were filmed and they were anesthetized again in the afternoon and filmed again. And he found different patterns between the two periods of the, of the day. In the morning, on average, each part of the retina was blocked about 75% of the time by a moving parasite. And this corresponds to the time of the day when the birds are feeding. The crested grebe, which is the main predator and the main definitive host of, uh, of the parasite and the main predator of the fish, only feeds in the morning. So when we repeated these measurements in the afternoon, we found that the parasites tend to move to the sides of the eye and they no longer really impair vision, allowing the fish to see normally almost. But this is a time of the day when there is no predation by the definitive host. So this highlights a relatively simple mechanism by which a parasite can interfere with the anti-predator behavior of its host. There is no magical chemical change in, in the host. It's just that the parasite is in the eye, it blocks vision, and bingo, the behavior can be changed. But in most cases, more complex mechanisms are probably necessary. Let me go back to these examples I've mentioned before of two completely different parasites, the myrmidid nematodes and the hairworms, belonging to different phyla, but both capable of uh, inducing a very similar change of behavior, causing a terrestrial arthropod to find water. What might cause this? Well, many years ago, we began by looking at uh, the uh, concentrations of ions inside the emolymph of those terrestrial arthropods. The logic here is that if the concentrations of various ions and the overall osmolality of the emolymph increases, this should lead the animal to seek water. Because in most animals, this causes thirst and, and, and a need to drink and find water. So what you have here is the concentration of different ions, as well as the overall osmolality of the emolymph inside this sand upper, which is infected by uh, myrmidid nematodes, it is plotted as a function of the length of the worm. It is only the large worm that wants to change the behavior of the host because it is only the large worms that are ready to come out of the host and water. So my student Caroline Williams found a positive relationship between the size of these worms and the concentrations of ions and overall osmolality, suggesting that perhaps when the worm is really big, um, because of its need to, uh, to drink, the host might be looking for water. However, we're increasingly interested in a, a deeper sort of, of mechanistic explanation. And we are now looking at whether the parasite can actually reach inside the genome of the host and alter gene expression. And our first attempt to measure this involved the use of proteomics, trying to characterize the, the profile of proteins within the brains of infected, uh, uh, infected hosts. So what you have here is a measure of the uh, relative concentrations of different proteins in the brains of these sand uppers. Um, the uh, blue ones are in uninfected sand uppers. The green ones have a little worm. So this is a worm that is not expected to change behavior because it's not ready to come out. And the red ones, are uh, sand upper brains uh, arboring a large worm, so a worm that is about ready to come out. For each of these different sand uppers in each of these different columns, we had triplicates uh, measurements for each uh, in each case, and each line here represents a different protein. But ignore these details. What matters is that you should be clearly seeing that the pattern of pro uh, protein concentrations in the brains of sand uppers that have a big worm is very different from what you find in the brains of uninfected sand uppers or those with a small worm. And we repeated this with the other model involving again a myrmidid nematode, but this time uh, an earwig as a host. And you can see here that for the earwigs with the big worms, 
two of them have a, a very, very strikingly different patterns of protein profiles in their brains, but the other two have uh, protein profiles that are very similar to what we observe in earwigs that only have a small worm. So we explain this uh, uh, you know, in the following way. Um, we know that the onset of behavioral changes in the insect is very sudden. So it could be that these two earwigs had big worms, but these big worms had not yet started to initiate a behavioral change, whereas those two probably have. But what is clear from these studies is that at the level of proteins floating around in the brain, something happens at the ends of the infection uh, when the worm is ready to come out. So to push this one step further, we're currently using transcriptomic to more directly measure gene expression changes by looking at uh, using RNA-seq and, and RNA transcript in the, the brains of these insects to see whether uh, there is a change over time in gene expression. So the little uh, hypothetical graphs at the bottom so what sort of changes in gene expression we might get over time, either positive or, or negative, so up or down regulation of these genes uh, from when the worm is very small and we don't expect any behavioral change, all the way to uh, when the worm is very large. And it is the pattern on the far right that is the most interesting for us, because genes that show this sort of pattern of a change in their expression over time, peaking in the maximum change in expression when the worm is very big. These are the genes where we might find candidate genes, candidate mechanisms for the change in host behavior. If they peak early on, then they're unlikely to be, effect, uh, to be associated with the change in behavior that we observe when the worm is really big and, and ready to come out. So this work is still in progress, but to date we've identified about 9,000 RNA transcripts or, or something corresponding to uh, 9,000 genes, which show a change in gene expression from when the worm is very small, so early in the infection, all the way to late in the infection when the worm is large and ready to cause a change in behavior to get out of the host. The different colors here represent whether it's a positive or a negative change in gene expression. But at this stage, if we just look at the absolute change in uh, uh, gene expression, regardless of whether it is up or down regulation, well, the two graphs here show that uh, we have a large number of transcripts, almost 7,000, that show the peak change towards the last stages of infection. So it is amongst these particular ones that we might find genes that are candidates uh, associated with behavioral changes. And if we look more at their function using gene, um, gene um, uh, ontology to try to figure out what they do, we find that there are several of these that are associated with um, uh, locomotion. So genes that code for some uh, aspect of uh, locomotory activity in the earwigs. And because these, uh, these insects show very, very increased activity as they look for water in the latter stages of infection, these are pro possibly genes involved in this behavioral change. We also find several transcripts associated with the genes that code for some aspect of sensory perception. And if the animal is suddenly looking for a different microhabitat, looking for water, it has to respond to different sort of stimuli, and it is, again, plausible that these genes play a role in the behavioral change. Perhaps what was most interesting in this analysis, which, as I've said, is still ongoing, is that inside the brain of the earwigs, we actually find RNA transcripts that are of parasite origin. So we find the products the gene products of genes in the parasite genome floating around in the brain of the host. Now, this is interesting because these might represent the actual 
mechanism by which the parasite reaches inside the brain of the host to affect gene expression. And some of these genes may indeed be involved in gene expression. Uh, we found a gene there that uh, is associated with the uh, messenger RNA splicing factor, another one that codes for histone transcription modulation, all uh, aspects uh, or all uh, mechanisms known to affect gene expression. So we've just finished sequencing the genome of both the host and the worm, uh, and we are almost finished annotating it. So soon we will be in a better position to ascribe function to these various transcripts and figure out exactly which gene are turned on or off and actually what the gene, these genes are doing. So this is the transcriptomic work we've been doing in the brain of the insect, but we've also done uh, transcriptomic research on the parasite itself to see which genes are uh, show a change in expression over time inside the parasite itself. So what you have here is three stages of infection. If I start from the right, we have what we find in small worms, what we find in large worms that have not yet caused a change in behavior of their host, and on the left, what we find in the large worms as the host is showing abnormal behavior. So we captured the host that was showing abnormal behavior, collected the big worm from it, and obtained uh, its gene to look at gene expression. And you can see again that there are many transcripts that show differential expression uh, changing over the course of infection. We can split those based on the patterns they show, and we are finding several genes uh, for instance, in this case, that show a peak change in expression in the latter stages of, uh, of infection. There's a bunch of others that also show this to a lesser extent. It's a smaller change in expression. And as we finalize our annotation of the genome, we're hoping soon to be able to uh, highlight the function of these particular genes. But it does suggest that late in the infection, inside the parasite itself, there's a change in gene expression, which matches a change in gene expression in the host. So somehow in there, these things are working together to lead to a host that is suddenly looking for water. Now I should point out that we're trying to do this study in parallel with the parasites from the other phylum, the airworms, which also um, produce a similar change in, in the behavior of their host. What we have here is a video that was taken by my student, Jeff Doherty. So this is a weta. Weta are native New Zealand crickets. And this one is infected by hairworms. Now it is currently doing something that is completely abnormal. It has found water in it. It's putting his, his rear end in water and you can see uh, the worms are starting to come out. There should be two or three worms coming out of this worm. You can see those lines coming out of the worm. Uh, sorry, coming out of the cricket. Um, so these parasites have forced this cricket to look for water. So what we're doing, and this is just starting, is trying to repeat the transcriptomic study inside this other system to see whether the genes changed by this parasite are similar to the genes whose expression is changed by the myrmidid nematodes that belong to a different phylum but cause a similar change in behavior. So we're looking for convergence at, at the genetic level uh, in the mechanisms used by these parasites. This is just starting, I have no data, but I want to make a small detour and say a few more words about this particular parasite because we're, we're doing other, words, uh, other work on this, uh, this parasite as well. If you look in the bottom left here, you have the life cycle of the parasite. Yes, it is true, it infects a terrestrial insect and it must cause the insect to go to water. But after the worm comes out of this insect in water, it, was, it will lay its eggs in the water and these eggs will then infect an aquatic insect, like a caddis fly, a mayfly, for instance, a stonefly. These insects, when they become adult and leave the water, will bring the parasite back to land. So it's important for the parasite to go from terrestrial to aquatic habitat, but it must also return from aquatic habitat 
to terrestrial habitat. And we hypothesize that if the parasite is capable of manipulating the behavior or the phenotype of its terrestrial host to go to water, why shouldn't it, should it not also be capable of manipulating the phenotype of its aquatic host to go back to land? Here you have a, a video of one of these larvae coming out of an egg that has been ingested by an aquatic insect. And you can see that it has this little proboscis that shoots forward, which allows it to burrow in the flesh of an aquatic insect. And it, there it, it will insist, you have some cyst on the right here, and it will wait inside the aquatic insect. In fact, it can be in, not necessarily an insect, it can be inside any aquatic uh, invertebrate, and it awaits the return to land. When they do this, though, they face some uh, a range of potential risks. And the first one is that the immune system of the insect host can kill them. This series of photos shows uh, uh, our pictures taken by my student, Jeff Doherty, of what we find inside caddis flies and mayflies. We have cysts of these airworms that are partially or completely melanized and encapsulated. And in some cases, they, they can be killed. So one risk they face in their attempt to go back to land is that they might be killed by the immune responses of their aquatic host. But perhaps a bigger risk is that they may end up in an aquatic invertebrate that will never take them back to land. This is a uh, result from one stream in the little the, the mountains of, uh, of, of central New Zealand. Uh, we have data from several such streams, but this, this one will illustrate what I'm talking about. What we have here are the, uh, the densities of airworm cysts per meter square, which is simply the product of the densities of the aquatic invertebrates multiplied by the average number of cysts that they have per individual. All the green bars indicate uh, hosts that can potentially go back to land. So these are poten potential way out of the water for uh, the parasite. But all the red bars uh, indicate parasites that are dead, either because of the immune responses of their host, or if you look at the big red bar on the far right-hand side, uh, this is uh, for the parasites that find themselves in an, an, an oligochete, a little aquatic free-living worm that will never go back to land. So these parasites are in the wrong host. They're in a dead end and they will die. This is just, uh, I guess, a summary of some of the risks for the parasites on its attempt to return back to land. So we hypothesize that natural selection should place uh, great pressure on these parasites to evolve the ability to uh, change the phenotype of their aquatic insect host to accelerate the return to land. Staying in water for too long can be dangerous. So to test this, we began with a large number of caddis flies, uh, all at the same stage, all collected from the same stream at the same time. We kept them under identical condition in captivity in the lab. And we awaited until a certain proportion of them had turned into the pupil stage. So a pupa looks like this. It's still in the same sort of case, but the case becomes dark. And there's a little cap at the end, the little door. So, after, uh, so when we terminated the experiment, a certain proportion of these insects had turned to the pupil stage. And we could see whether the probability that they had reached the pupil stage at the end of the experiment was related to how many parasites they had, so the, the intensity of infection. And we found a significant positive relationship. So in other words, when they have many of these parasite cysts in their bodies, the development of these insects is accelerated. It speeds up. They, they achieve more, they, they, re, they reach that next stage faster. So, there are many potential explanations for this finding, but our favorite explanation is that maybe the parasite is manipulating the development of its host to accelerate it, to accelerate its return to land. 
So this would suggest that within this one life cycle, maybe the parasite is capable of altering the phenotype, not just of the terrestrial host, but also of the aquatic host. Anyway, I, I will stop this little story here. I just want to finish by going back to the mechanisms I was discussing earlier and giving you an idea of what we're doing now. For most of my career, uh, like most other parasitologists, I have considered the host-parasite interaction as a two-player game. The host and the parasite interact together, and maybe the parasite influences the host. Well, clearly, in light of the research done in recent years, uh, this was a very simplistic way of seeing things. We now know that all animals, even the smallest one, harbor microbial communities consisting of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoans. So if we open the next Russian doll in the series, uh, we might find that the parasites themselves harbor their own microbes. And if parasites have a microbiome, a set of symbiotic bacteria or viruses or other microbes that live with the parasite, it could be that whatever is good for the parasite is also good for its microbes. If the parasite gets transmitted, the microbes get transmitted. So in this situation, we might consider that the parasite and its microbiome form an integrated team, which increasingly people are referring to as holobionts. Um, basically, they work as a unit because they have the same interests. So in a case like this, it could be that if there are genes involved in manipulating the host, why would these genes come you know, necessarily from the parasite genome? Maybe they come from the genome of its symbiotic microbes, since they form a team. Well, our first step was to demonstrate that parasites have their own micro, uh, microbiomes. And we've already shown this now for a few different parasite species. So as an example here, uh, consider the trematode Coitosecum parvum, which has to go through three different hosts to complete one generation, so its life cycle is quite complex. We have characterized the microbiome of the parasite at its three different life stages, and also uh, the microbiome of its host and of the external environment. And what we find is that the parasite has, uh, has its own unique microbiome, a core set of bacteria that are different from uh, those that we find in the host or those that we find in the external environment. You can see this in this PCA. Uh, all the blue dots represent the microbial communities in the parasites, and the other colors represent microbial communities in the different hosts or in the environment. And you can see that the parasite has a distinct microbiome. These also are transmitted vertically, so which means they basically follow the parasite from generation to generation. So whatever is good for this parasite is also good for its microbes. So our hypothesis is that maybe the genes of the microbes also contribute to manipulating host behavior. So we just started a new project. The, the funding started about three weeks ago, and we will investigate this hypothesis using the three different model systems shown here. I have talked about these model systems during my presentation. So we're currently trying to um, characterize the microbiome of these different parasites uh, and figure out whether particular microbes are associated with a stronger manipulation of the host, or perhaps other microbes uh, prevent the manipulation altogether. So this work is just starting. I'm just mentioning it now to give you an idea of what we're doing for the next two, three years in my lab. And this brings me to, to the end of my presentation. Um, I just want to acknowledge the wonderful and enthusiastic students, postdocs, and collaborators uh, I've worked with over the past several years. Without their work, there would have been very little to talk about today. And I also want to thank all of you for listening to this presentation. And thanks again for the invitation.